Hello and welcome to Introduction to 3D Printing. This is the second part as a part of a four-part series as presented by the Integrated Teaching and Learning Program here at CU Boulder. In this section of the workshop, we'll learn how to operate our self-service 3D printers. As a reminder, my name is Rachel. I'm an engineer here for the ITL program, and I'll be here to guide you through this workshop today. So let's get started. All right, now for the fun stuff. We're gonna talk about self-service printers, the ones that you run. Within the ITL laboratory, we have 10 Lulzbot machines, and there are two different models when it comes to these Lulzbots. We have a TAS 6 and a Mini 2. You can think of them as pretty much the same printer. In fact, they have the same tool head that does all the important stuff, the heating and extruding of filament. However, the difference is that the TAS 6 has a much larger, larger build volume than the Mini 2 does, which is the space that you have to build your three-dimensional object. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. In today's workshop, we're gonna go over the three steps that it takes to get a part printed. First, you're gonna need a 3D model. And second, you're gonna need to load that model into Cura, which is our slicing software that communicates with the printer. And finally, you're going to need to prepare the machine and start the print. So we'll go over those simple steps and then what to do when your part finishes. But before we begin, I want to begin with an anatomy of the printer and how it works. Now, you're probably thinking, Rachel, why should we care about these kinds of details? They matter just as they matter in selecting any manufacturing process. It's going to impact the way you design your model such that it's optimized for the process it takes. Then it's going to help you place it and prepare it in Cura because you're going to know where it is going to print best and when it's going to need supports. And then finally, it's going to help you prepare your machine for success and then diagnose and fix things when they go wrong. So in total, it's just going to make you better at 3D printing. So let's begin. As a reminder, our Lulzbots use a process called fused deposition modeling which is a process by which a filament is heated, that plastic is then extruded and rapidly cooled to build layer by layer a three-dimensional model. In order to make this process possible, we can boil our printer down to three significant components. We have the tool head, the bed, and the print frame. So let's start with the tool head. Let's begin by asking ourselves a question. Why do you think the nozzle is heated? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Pretty simple, right? To melt the material. The tool head is responsible for not only melting the material, but grabbing it, feeding it through, and then rapidly cooling it once it's deposited on the build plate. When we look at the feeding elements, it includes the idler, which you'll actually move to place the filament in the column, that provides tension and alignment to the filament as that hobbed gear in the back drives the filament through. And the driving element there is a stepper motor. As the filament is then fed through, we get to the heating elements. The heating elements include what's called the hot end. And on the hot end, you have the heater block, which has a thick red heater cartridge that provides heat to melt that plastic. And then a thermistor wire, which is going to come in and check the temperature and maintain it. And then finally, the, the filament is fed through the nozzle where it's extruded onto the build plate. Then we have the bed. So now we know why the tool head heats, but why does the bed heat? Again, I'll give you a second to think about it. A common misconception is that the bed heats to help your part stick. And while that's somewhat true, it doesn't tell the whole story. The bed is actually heating to help release the part at the end of the print. The printer and the bed are hot while your part is printing. But then what happens when the print finishes? The bed begins to cool. And as that bed cools, something pretty awesome happens. Your part begins to contract and that process of contraction helps to release the part. So when we look at the bed, there are three critical parts. We have the PCB heater, which provides the heat to the bed as the part is printing. 
glass, which then helps to distribute that heat evenly across the bed. And finally, a PEI laminate, which is where your filament is actually deposited on. Finally, we have the frame. The frame is where the movement happens in the X, Y, and Z directions. The X we denote as the movement of the nozzle left and right on that X carriage. The Y is the movement of the bed back and forth. And both of these are moving along rods driven by pulley and stepper motor systems. Their movement is creating your 2D layers. And then the Z is the upward movement that's allowing those layers to be built up. And, and that occurs along a threaded screw driven by a motor. Now that you have an understanding about how the 3D printer works, let's dive into how to operate these machines. Starting with the first step, you acquire a 3D printable model in one of three ways. One, you can design your own in a computer-aided design software such as Onshape or SolidWorks. Two, you could acquire one from a model sharing site such as Thingiverse, GrabCAD, or 3D Continent Central. Model sharing sites like Thingiverse here are sites where designers share 3D printer files or computer-aided design models for other people to download and utilize. The third way is by using something like a 3D scanner where you can scan an object and get a 3D model for it. The critical step, regardless of how you're acquiring your model, is converting your model to a .stl. .stl stands for Stereolithography or Standard Triangle Language. The important thing is that this file describes the surface geometry of your part. And when we get to Cura, you'll understand why that's all this software really cares about when it comes to 3D printing. Now I'll show you an Onshape. Getting a model exported as a .stl is rather simple. What you're going to want to do is rather than saving your part as a part file, you'll want to export it and choose .stl from the drop-down menu, and then select the proper units. Then the other thing to keep in mind is, while 3D Continent Central and GrabCAD often include the model files, so you may need to bring these into their computer-aided design softwares and export them as .stls before you begin printing. Now that we have a 3D model, Step two will be preparing that model in Cura, our slicing software. When you first open Cura, you may or may not see this add printer screen, but just in case you do, here's what you'll need to do. You'll need to select the printer you're on, which is either going to be a Lulzbot Mini 2 or a TAS 6, because that's what we carry in the lab. The difference is the TAS 6 is the larger of the two printers, Pretty easy to keep straight, right, because it's a mini printer. So I'm going to select the TAS 6, and then you'll need to select a tool head. So both of our printers use the SE 0.5 millimeter arrow V2, so you can select that one. Then you'll go add printer. There will be a screen that comes up with the machine settings. There shouldn't be anything you need to change here, so you can press finish. And now you're ready to use Cura. So before we get started, I just want to explain the, the lay of the land here. You have two tabs here. You have your prepare and your monitor tab. The difference between the two tabs is the prepare is basically where you're going to do all of the preparing of your 3D printable model. And so that's going to be things like setting it in place, choosing whether you want supports, that sort of stuff. Then in monitor, this is going to be really the section where you're preparing your machine and monitoring the print. And so getting all the settings right on your machine is going to be important here. So starting with prepare, we're going to want to open file and add our STL file, which is the file format that we discussed we need. So I'm going to select this model airplane. It's going to place it randomly on this build plate. And the cool thing here is when I talk about build volume, it's really this cube of theoretical space, so to say, that you have to print your part on, on your printer. And so it shows you the volume that you have, and it shows you where the build plate is, which is where it's going to lay its first layer. So there's a couple types of views that you get here. You get a solid view of the part and then layer views, which gives you that kind of detail of the layer by layer. And if I drag this up and down right here, you can actually see the layers it's going to build to get to your 3D model. 
And so that's one fun feature here. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do uh, once you get your, your part placed is you want to know a little bit about the controls. So if I select the, the part here by clicking on it, I can place this part by taking the arrows. So right now we're in the move feature. You can scale it, rotate it, mirror it, multiply it. These things are pretty intuitive. So if I'm with move, I'm going to select where I want it to be printing on the print bed. And it makes oftentimes the most sense with a single part just to place it in the center. So I just grab the arrows, position it where I want it to. And then here is the scale feature. This can sometimes be useful if you've designed in a different unit and it didn't import properly. So you need to scale it from inches to millimeters, so to say. Then the rotate feature is useful uh, if you want to place your model differently on the bed. Say if I wanted to print it, you know, upside down rather than right side up. So you just grab these little circles here and you pull them in either direction and it rotates the model. The nice thing to know about here is the lay flat feature. So just in case it's not actually flat on the build plate, it'll make sure it's flat. So rotated it for some reason, but uh, anytime you can click outside of here and then those features go away, just make sure your part's highlighted again. Those are the key ones here. So once you have your part placed, now you can start worrying about this side of the menu. So the first thing you want to select is your material. So I'm going to select the PLA Polymaker. This is what we sell is PLA at the ITLL. So I'll discuss a little bit later how you can get that purchase, but that's about all we allow on the printers. So you'll select your material, then you want to select your profile. What profile is specifying is essentially the layer thickness and they name these as high speed, so to say, because when you increase your layer thickness, it's going to print much faster versus high detail. When you have those thinner layers, it gets the details a little bit better. We recommend that you print on standard because it doesn't really make a huge difference. And this way you're not compromising, sp you know, speed for quality or detail for speed, the amount of time it takes to print. So standard is a good setting. Then you have the print setup. So we recommend you stay on recommended. It's going to give you all you need to be able to change, but it's worthwhile to know that if you select this custom button here, you get um, many, many, many more print settings to change. And this is a more advanced thing to do if you want to get really into the nitty gritty and start tweaking your settings. But for the most part, you can stick on recommended. You'll be just fine. Here, you're going to select your infill next. So remember how I discussed that our files come in a .stl file format, which describes the surface geometry. Well, our printer really only cares about the surface geometry because of this thing called infill. It actually fills in your material based on what you specify. So if I switch from solid view, which is just the mode in which I'm viewing it, same thing, to layer view, it'll show me these internal layers. So I'm gonna drag this down and it shows right here, I'll go to about the middle of the part. If you check here, I'll zoom in nice and close. You can see that we have this honeycomb structure here. And these little rectangles is what we call, you know, the infill of the part. And you can, if we're at 20% right now, if I change it to 50 or 60%, you'll see that there's much more material being used. And the reason that we like being able to change the internal structure of the part is it's going to print much faster and use much less material if we use a lower infill. And most of the time, you don't need a solid part to get the structural integrity that you need for that part. So we often recommend to use a 20 to 30% infill, but this is going to be very dependent on how your part's going to be used and what it'll need to withstand. So uh, st sticking with 20 to 30% here, and if I drag this back up, it'll show me the entire part. So I'm going to 
go back to my main view here. And next, we'll want to pick the generate support section. So generate support is going to tell your printer whether it needs what we call support material, which is essentially just extra material in places where you have things called overhangs. So I'm going to switch back to the solid view. And the reason being is in Cura, you'll notice that there's this red that you get on any part that needs what it believes is support material. And this is going to be anywhere where you're building up, say, layer by layer by layer, and then all of a sudden you get to one of these wings and there's nothing below it. So the printer has nothing to print on top of here. So it starts printing and it's going to either fail or it's going to leave like a spaghetti-like layer underneath the print part. And so what you'll want to do is add support material. So I'll click generate support. Not all parts need support, but this one does with all its overhangs. I'll switch from solid view to layer view. Well, it'll, it'll actually show me where the supports are going to be. Solid view doesn't show it for one reason or another, so you'll go to layer view. This is what's actually going to be printed. Now you'll see there's all this material below it. And this support material, you'll now be responsible for breaking away after the part prints. So it's going to maintain that it prints well, but whenever you don't need to use support material, that's much better because it can be harder to break away. Then we have build plate adhesion. So right now it has a skirt here, and a skirt is just this thin little layer it prints around your part. Skirts are nice because that's the first piece of material that's laid down on the print bed. So I always add a skirt because then it deposits the material before it starts on my main part. Now, build plate adhesion, it's called build plate adhesion because you can select these other two things, which is a brim and a raft. So we'll start with a brim. What the brim does is it helps the part better adhere to the bed because it adds this layer around your part, which gives it more surface area. And this print, for example, wouldn't need it. But when you're dealing with a very small feature that's sticking to the bed, then you might want to add a brim or a raft, which is just a larger version of that brim to increase that surface area to help it slice. So this is a nice error to get. We can learn from it. It's telling me it can't slice because when I increase it to a raft, it's not fitting on this central area. So I'll move it and now it'll generate the raft and you'll see that um, that's much thicker. So only necessary if you have a, a small, small part that needs more surface area. So I'm gonna stick with a skirt for the time being. Now that I have my part placed, I've selected whether it needed support material or not, and whether it needs adhesion, we're now at the point where we could get ready to prepare our printer and switch over to the monitor section. So just to review, you're going to open your part. You're going to use all these features here to place it. Select your material, your profile, typically standard. Your print setup will simply be infill, support material, and adhesion, and then you'll be ready to move over to the monitor section. Thank you for joining me for part two of this four-part Introduction to 3D Printing workshop. See you next time.